Welcome to the Astronomy Club of Tulsa, October style. Uh, my name is John Land. I'm the newsletter editor. Most of you, how many of your actual members? And Jared, can you help me get a count? Not everybody. Looks like nine. Most everybody. Looks like twenty. Owen's back there. He's not listening. But oh, I didn't see the hands in the front. He's a member. Dan's a member. Don's out. Okay. One of the things we have to do is be sure we have a quorum for our vote tonight. Anyway, I'm John Land. I, I do the newsletters. So most of you have been bothered by my newsletters. Hey, Ben, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, ben, he's one of our two high school kids. So we got me. Starting them out young. That's good. Anyway, so we got a lot to do tonight. And we have some guests on, as you can see on the screen. These are some of well, they went away. But they're right. some of my our friends from the Bartlesville Club, uh, Bartlesville Astronomical Society, because our guest speaker tonight is uh, John Blazy from the Bartlesville Club. And he's going to be telling us what they're doing with Os Osage Hills State Park. There he is. So that'll be interesting. It's quite, quite nearby. So, all right. Anyway, do we have any first time guests? <gasps> there we are, right there. And new members, right? Very good. So that's a good deal. All right. If you'll put our uh, program up, Dan. There we go. So welcome to our members and guests to the Astronomy Club of Tulsa for October 22nd. And go ahead and turn it to the next one. So here's some things we're going to do tonight. Hopefully we're kind of learning this. We have some people watching on Zoom. Uh, Bartlesville, I've already mentioned. Uh, we've got a member that's in Prescott, Arizona. Hopefully he's tuned in. And some others are not able to come in person. So it's kind of a, you know, learning as we go. But we're gonna have a short business session and hopefully you've all gotten the ballot if you're a member. So we'll explain that. I've had several of you ask me questions about the, what we do with board members. So we'll go through that. We'll talk about our observing nights coming up this fall. I've got a couple questions about it. And we have our annual club dinner. I don't know whether you saw the sign up list sheet out there. For those of you here tonight, you can go ahead and sign up, but I'll talk about that later. And then uh, we're going to talk about volunteers to help uh, with several of our events. We've got a big one coming up November the 11th. And of course, our guest speaker. And then as time allows, we'll talk about our lunar eclipse coming up in November. And if Sky will cooperate, Brian's set up a telescope on the deck out back and you can look at Jupiter and Saturn. I don't think the moon's up yet. We have um, Venus for a little while. Yeah, Venus for a little while. It may not be up when we get down. So uh, that's kind of what we're going to be doing tonight. So first thing we're going to do, does everyone who's a member have a ballot? I, uh, uh, do we, Don has some pencils. I need one. Yeah, I have one so too. Kind of raise your hand when they have share pencil. pens or pencils. Oh, I got so a go pen. to the next slide. Sorry, I've been busy doing everything. <laughs> been busy running around. Didn't grab a ballot. That's my bad. Yeah. Yeah, give Dan a ballot. I forgot. Yeah, that's okay. And Brad, I think, over there needs one. I'll go get it. Okay, first, first thing on your ballot. It's kind of a business thing. Last time we redid our bylaws was 2009 and didn't occur to us to, uh, you know, we had the internet by then, but it didn't occur to us that, you know, how, how much electronic communication would be in use. So of course, last year we had exclusively had the Zoom meetings and our board's been meeting by Zoom. But it wasn't officially recognized in our bylaws one way or the other. So that's added to the amendments. Uh, Don Bradford, who helped you sign in, 
it helped us get the legalese of it. So you can read them up there. The first one is to, upon proper notice, otherwise provided in the bylaws and approval of the board uh, of directors, any meeting of the membership may be held by electronic means permitting each member qualified to vote to participate and vote. In addition, with the same proper notice and board approval, a vote on a specific issue may be noticed and received from qualified members by electronic means. Now we don't meet in the summertime, and sometimes that's been a roadblock to getting things done. It had to be done in the summer. If it was a big expense, we had to get membership approval. The second one kind of is the same way, but it applies to the board meetings upon proper notice, otherwise provided by law bylaws. Any duly called meeting of the board of directors may be held by electronic means, permitting each vote member qualified to participate and vote. In addition, with the same proper notice, a vote on specific issues may be noticed and received by the voting board members by electronic means. A lot of good legal words. Thank you, Don. <laughs> so uh, there's a section on your top of your ballot to vote yes or no or that. All right, next one. Hey, yes, your question. Well, yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, we're working on that tonight, actually, kind of experiment. Okay. There's some people on Zoom, and they're, what we've done the last, last two times is we recorded it, and let's watch it later, because we didn't know for sure it would work. Oh, okay. We'll get some feedback tonight, see how well it works. Okay, that's part, part of why I had the light, which I'm not using, so you can see who's up front. All right, next one there. Uh, here are the people who are candidates for our officers and for our board. Uh, for presidents, myself, John Land. I've been a member of the club since 77 and done various things in the club. Uh, for vice president, we have Brian Kyle in the back. Brian runs the planetarium at the Tulsa Space Tulsa air and space museum and you've been a member what five six years we come up on four four years okay but he's real active there and he's very knowledgeable for secretary we have jerry cassidy there in the back and most of you know jerry he's been around for a while he's uh, done secretary before and he's been on the board for quite a while it's always faithful to come to to help with uh, the various observing nights. And our treasurer is not able to be with us tonight, but John Newton, uh, he's done a bang up job of being our treasurer last year of secretary and then took over the treasury job. And he's really helped us move forward to, to get everything in a well-organized manner. So those are the officers candidates. And you had questions about the board. All of these people can be on the board. You don't have to pick two or three. They're all candidates for the board. You can approve them or not approve them. But up there at the top, we've got Don Bradford. Don's been with us two years, three years? A little over three. A little over three years. He's been very, very helpful with the legal uh, aspect of, you know, our new, we've acquired some new land from a member that we deceased. And he's been helping us work through all of that. Uh, Jim Danforth is fairly new to the club, but he lives right next door to the observatory. And he's a longtime resident of the Mounds area. <clears throat> so he knows all the local resources and people around there. <clears throat> he's also the fire chief there at Mounds. So that, that's good to have the fire captain next door. Uh, down below is Adam. Adam's usually here. Adam's a young fella. He's been helping us for a while. As you can see, he's an excellent photographer. He does photography for various concert events and stuff. So that's maybe where he is now. 
And everyone knows Tamara. She's been so faithful to be our president several times. She's been secretary. I first met Tamara and Owen in 2004, four, three or four, when Mars was closest to the Earth it ever been. And they showed up with their little telescope and uh, they're still here. So we're glad to have her. Michael Blaylock, most of you know Michael. He's our astrophotographer. Uh, some of his pictures have been featured on the cover page of the newsletter. James Taggart, he's our observatory manager. He keeps the grounds together. He keeps us, he, we couldn't function without James. He's modernized uh, communications out there, helped us get Wi Fi out there. And he lives by, nearby, about three miles from the observatory. And then Skip, everybody knows Skip. And if you've been reading the newsletter, he's the one that's working on the uh, the new 12 and a half foot dome. Is that right, Skip? 12 and a half foot dome that uh, came through his family and they reassembled it and they have some big plans. He'll talk to us about that later. So those are our candidates for the board and officers for this coming year. We elect them each each October. So if you will uh, take a minute to turn up the lights enough they can see their ballot and mark those and then Jerry and Skip and maybe one other walk down and you pass them to the nearest aisle so they'll have a chance to count them here in a minute. I guess I would mark my ballot if I have one. I mean the ballot. I do. Just put nothing. I mean, there's voting nothing. It's not a yes or a no. Oh, oh. Yeah. oh thank you so much. Yes, <laughs> you collecting? I'm collecting. Perfect. Thank you. And I'm giving pimples. <laughs> Here, Bobby. And Bob, sorry. Can you hand that to somebody? Um, Brad over there, Go white ahead. shirt. He's collecting them. Okay. Well, I think that's all the lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't get any brighter. That's it. Bright as this room gets. Okay, somebody help Judy get hers done and we'll be, we'll be on, on our way here. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for showing up. One of the things we have to have on our by bylaws is a quorum. So that's good. And you guys figure out who's going to sit down and count. That will be good. We've got to count them tonight. Make it official. <laughs> All right, next slide. We lost Dan. Nope, I'm here. No, he's here. Upcoming club events. Uh, daylight time is finally going to end. Yay. I call it simple starlight time is returning November 7th. And you may have noticed the sun is setting earlier and earlier. And we flip the clock and the sun sets before 5.30. And that makes it really hard to have a Friday evening observing event. Either people have to leave work, come out and open up, or people arriving show up well after dark. So we decided at the last board meeting that we would try just having our observing nights on Saturdays. That way we can start early. We can open up at 4.30 or so. We can be set up in the daylight. We can have several hours of observing and then go home and get some, some rest if we want. So that's what we're going to be trying, at least during the winter months, from, uh, well, from November through March, whenever it changes. So we have a, a members. I didn't even put the date, did I? Yeah, I did. I didn't put the date. Oh, well, a member's night. 
next Saturday, not tomorrow, October 30th, and you can bring guests. You got a friend that wants to come and see the observatory, they can go to the uh, website and RSVP. Mainly we're doing that way so we don't have 100 people show up. And we're not prepared to help them. It worked really good in July. We had 45 or 50 people show up and we were prepared for them. Uh, and then, of course, we had situations with COVID in August and September. So we'll try that again and they can go to the website. The members don't have to RSVP, but we would like our guests to do that. But I forgot to put the date. It's uh, October 30th. Uh, November 6th is our annual club dinner. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. There was a sign up sheet uh, on the table, and hopefully it'll still be there when we get done. Uh, we need you to sign up by a week from Monday so that we can place our order with the caterer. Normally, we start all this stuff in August. <clears throat> but in August, we weren't sure we were even going to be able to have school for a while, were we then? That's right. Things were really uh, going bad on the, on the COVID. But it's looking up now, so that's good. I'll talk about it a little bit more. Central Starlight Time returns November 7th. So you get to sleep in an extra hour. The sun goes down early. It will get dark hours early. Can we ask everybody if anyone else has a ballot? Any more ballots? Well, you didn't get one to begin with. Okay. Last chance. Okay. I think we got that done. We have a lunar eclipse coming up. It's almost, almost a full eclipse. It's uh, the Friday morning, November 19th. And uh, I'll show you a little bit more at the end of the program after our speaker. But the enters the umbra, the Earth's inner shadow at 1.19 a.m. our time. Uh, and it's a long eclipse, runs till 4.47. But probably the best time to look at it is between 2.30 and 3.15 or so when it's going through its maximum, just skimming along the southern edge of the Earth's shadow. So. There'll be more of that. I'm going to try to post it on the website too. Now I have a question. I'll do two later on. Um, we usually have our observing nights at third quarter and at new moon. Guess what? Third quarter is Saturday of Thanksgiving week. Okay. So what I want to know, you do. Once you're here, I know my daughter's coming in from down from California and she would like to come to the observatory, but it's not going to be worth opening up if only one or two people show up. So how many might come? I know a lot of you travel. Get them up high so I can see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That'd be good. And you can bring family with you. Hopefully my wife's family doesn't all come because it's like it's their 75th annual family reunion. Oh wow. So they're coming in from five different states. So we might have a good crowd. They usually leave on Saturday. <laughs> anyway, so okay, we'll uh we'll we'll probably do that. We'll start early and, and end early. Of course, if it's the winter ice storm that we usually get Thanksgiving, we'll we'll do something different. Uh, we have our members night, December the 4th, and the time is wrong. I'm sorry. I'm trying to put all this together. It'll be before sunset, so it'll be like 4.30. 4.30. Duh. Okay. Anyway, I did, you know, you look at stuff and look at stuff, but don't ever get it all cleared, cleared up. Our next uh, meeting here, other than the dinner, will be December the 10th. Now, the next question, the third quarter lands on Christmas. And I know we're not going to be able to have anything on Christmas Eve or Christmas. But uh, the next one, the new moon, falls about January 31st or December 31st. I'm not coming out here December 31st with the casino down the road. But uh, 
Skip suggested that, you know, January 1st, you see how football you want to see. And uh, there might be people who want to come out. So any opinions on that? I'd go. We'll, we'll, we'll probably send out a poll on that. But if we get enough people interested, we've got another couple of meetings to talk about it. But the other option was maybe to have one in the middle of the week. John, what? I have a question. On the website, it shows that there's a members of Jordan Life on November the 5th, which is the day before the dinner. Is that still happening? Uh, yes. My bad. <laughs> like I said, I didn't get it all edited right. Yes, we still have one on the 5th. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm, I apologize. I get newbie points, okay? <laughs> anyway, so we're having a members night on the 5th. That's Friday. We have our dinner on the 6th. The next one's on the 30th. And it looks like there's enough interest. We'll have something on 27. So, all right, I think we've covered that. Our annual club dinner, we didn't get to have one last year. But uh, we're going to have Oklahoma Joe's. I love Oklahoma Joe's. Uh, going to cater it. It's going to be right here at the high school. And we're going to do it differently. I've talked with Dan. We're going to set up the tables in the big lobby so they're spaced out a little bit more. And instead of having a buffet where everybody walks through and serves, you know, fix their own stuff, we'll get four or five volunteers. You walk by and they'll serve your plate and tell them what you want and they can wear gloves and we do that at our church everybody goes by the, the serving window and you know we get what we want and it works out real well we usually have like 200 people so it goes pretty quick so that's just a little bit of extra safety for everybody to do that uh, we've got a choice of three meats well we'll have three meats and I kind of put out there on my sign up what, what you preferred. I didn't think ahead. I said, pick one meat. Well, I like brisket, but my wife likes cold pork. So I had to circle both of them. <laughs> but anyway, so you can circle the ones you like. We can kind of see how that works out. Uh, they have what's called their best baked beans, and they're great. And you have to order one or the other, potatoes, salad, or spicy coleslaw so you kind of see what everybody thinks about that i'll try to send out well i will send out an email with more sign up uh, michael blaylock's going to help us get people signed up too so uh, bread and barbecue sauces of course desserts there good bread pudding price will be 13 dollars a person for adults 10 dollars for kids 12 to 18 but then you get a bargain there you go. And if the kids are under 12 or seven dollars, then we'll probably just comp any preschoolers that we have to have. So anyway, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that a little bit more. It'll be cash or check. And if you bring cash, try to bring the exact change. We can't be breaking a bunch of $20 bills and have anything left. But we cannot run a club dinner by two or three people so we need ladies volunteers to get together get decorations get some plastic tablecloths make it look pretty okay uh, my wife told me you need to get some ladies to volunteer for that you guys don't know nothing <laughs> So I'm not arguing with that. So they, they'll have to come early, set up the table. We, we put those guys and set up the table. But decorate it up, get the things pretty. We'll have sign up here afterwards. Uh, we'll need a couple of people to sit at the desk and collect the money. Uh, one of the things that you can pick up that night if they come in, we've got an order form out there for the 2022 astronomy calendars. Don't, uh, 
John told me they already have 30 people signed up, but he's planning on having them here that night. So you bring your money for your calendar too. Uh, so we'll need some people to help with that. We need at least five people to help serve the, the plates. And we maybe can switch off so you're not having to do that all the time. And then we have to clean up. We have to put everything away. We have to sweep, vacuum, and get out of here, hopefully by 8, 8.30. So I'm going to pass around the sheet afterwards so you can come up and see me, or I'll be calling you. You don't want me calling you. We need, we need help for all that. So that's going to be the sixth. So mark it on the calendar. We'll come up here about 4.30, get started, and then we'll have our dinner at 6. And it'll be good. You get to visit with everybody. Bring your spouses. Uh, our girlfriends. <laughs> yeah, anyway. All right. Or you can bring your parents, too, Dan. All right, next one, Dan. Oh, get involved. We've got 229 members. How many are here tonight? 25, maybe? No. Get involved in something. And you like astronomy. It would be a lot better if you get to learn all of the ins and outs. And we can do more activities if people get involved. So uh, we need lots of help with our club dinner. I'd like somebody else, as I mentioned, to help coordinate the setup. Uh, I guess that's always already called covered that good night. Other volunteers, October 30th is our members and guest night. I finally got it up there, didn't I? At the, at the observatory, we get guests and we want to greet them and set up some scopes and binoculars and uh, have the dome open and, you know, things like that. Uh, November 11th, we've been invited to come out to Tulsa Botanical Gardens. Oh. It's way out northeast of town. It's pretty good skies to the west from the north. Of course, down toward Tulsa, it's not. But it's a big open area, probably 20 acres, a big pond. And we're going to set up some telescopes that's their members' night. They still have stuff decorated for Halloween. And so it'll be a good opportunity to come out there. Um, sun got sunsets at 5.15 that night. But it's a Thursday, so we'll need some help. So let me know about that. We need at least six telescopes. And they're going to close up at nine, so it won't be all night. And you really need more volunteers. If you've been in the club a year and you're interested in coming up and helping us open and close and, and learn about the, all the ins and outs and get a key to the facility, uh, we have an application form for all of that. So that way it doesn't fall on a couple of dozen people and have to scramble around about who's going to be in town that night. So anyway, those are some goals for the coming year. All right. So our guest speaker, we're going to get him on here in just a minute. It's Mr. John Blazy from our Barnesville Astronomical Society. He's going to tell us about their efforts to make Osage Hill State Park a dark sky friendly <coughs> location working toward obtaining the International Dark Sky Park <coughs> Certification. How many have been to Osage Hills? It's a pretty nice place. It's just 10 miles west of Bartlesville. They've already done quite a bit with the lighting, but I'm not going to spoil all that he has to say. So I'm going to get off, and we're going to let uh, John share with us what's going on. All right, thank you very much. So you can see that okay? Yes, and can you hear me okay? You just did the PowerPoint. Don't, we don't hear you, John. Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? We can hear you on Zoom. Oh. Go ahead and talk again. 
All right. Can you hear me now? There we are. Now we got you. All right. Um, my name is John Blazy from Bartlett's, Oklahoma. I'm with the Bartlett's Astronomical Society. And tonight is a presentation to the Tulsa Astronomy Club um, on the International Dark Sky Places. And it's on obtaining international dark sky designation for parks, communities, and urban areas. We're not going to cover all these in details tonight because we need another three or four hours. But I'll be covering a little bit about what my work is with the Oklahoma State Park and one of our local parks here in Bartlesville. A quick overview of the Osage Hill State Park. Um, I have given before a presentation on the Oklahoma dark skies. Some of you may or may not have attended or may have seen this before. I presented it to the Oklahoma Astronomy Club up here and a few other places. And that's with working with John Blasey and John Grismore, I think who's on tonight. And we presented this last year sometime. So some of this may be rerun. For those who missed it, where is Osage Hill State Park? I hope most of you know where Bartlesville is, at least has been through Bartlesville. It's north of Tulsa, about 45 to 50 miles, depending upon where you're located. Osage Hill State Park is about 10 miles to the west. You can see on this map, it's uh, the little green space. So it's not too bad to come, probably maybe an hour drive from Tulsa to Osage Hills. Or some people have actually spent the night in Bartonsville at the Price Tower, which is a nice uh, Frank Lloyd Wright architecture hotel, but that's a different presentation. Osage Hills State Park has been set aside probably in the 1930s and 40s. Um, part of it was part of the works uh, WPA back in um, the 30s and 40s. It's about 1,200 acres of park. It's about 10 miles from Bartonsville. It's open around the clock, 24 seven. They will appreciate you if you minimize your travel in the park um, between the hours of 11 p.m. at night and 6 a.m. in the morning. They say that the park's open from 6 to 11. So it's just mainly if you're running around after 11 p.m., pay attention that people are trying to sleep. But there's quite a few camping areas in the area. But the park is open 24 seven. There's camping facilities. There's restroom facilities. It's a reasonable dark skies. There are darker places to go in Oklahoma, but this is not bad for us. But the park has always been there. I mean, there are things from, well, basically prehistoric area for uh, cave drawings and things like that that they have found. And so it's been around a long time. And uh, but the question is, in these days, how can it be made more astro uh, astronomy friendly? As you can see, it's starting to be surrounded by light. Um, to the right on this map is Bartlesville, big bright orange glow, not as big as Tulsa, Oklahoma City, but it's uh, extending out there. Up north, you see Copan a little bit, Copan, Kansas. Uh, yeah, Copan, Oklahoma. And uh, to the lower left is Pahuska. And Osage Hill State Park is this kind of nestled between Osage, between Pahuska and Barbotsville. Now up the left-hand corner, it says it's dark up here. A little town called Bollingerville and Big Heart. And it is quite a bit darker. Uh, we did a little survey and we went up there and we were impressed how dark that was. And we go further north, you get into a uh, big, large Adams Ranch. But it also extends into Kansas, and that's a pretty big dark area for eastern Kansas and eastern Oklahoma. It's not as dark as Black Mesa. It's not as dark as places in Texas and Arizona, but um, it's not bad for here. The main thing about places like Bollingerville and up north, um, that lake up there is Hula Lake. Um, it's a short ways up there. But it seems like when you start coming back at 1.30 or 2 in the morning, it's a lot further back. So we went out there one night and took pictures. And this is from the entrance of the dark sky. And you can see north to Kansas. Yeah, it's kind of dark. You can even see some uh, stars and a uh, part of a constellation in the background. 
You look towards the northeast, you can see, well, lights of Copan, not too bad. Look towards Bartlettsville, yeah, a couple of bright red lights, big light dome. Look towards Tulsa, what you see in the background, this is the Tulsa light dome from Osage Hill State Park. Uh, these lights you see on the ground and over here to the right of that picture, they're no longer there. That's part of the improvements that the park has made and there's very minimal lighting there now. Even off towards Bahuska, uh, this tree is background in the light. And then over, I think this is Arkansas City. We didn't know this Arkansas City or Wichita. We kind of said settled on Arkansas City or Arkansas City, depending upon which state you're from. So yeah, there's light pollution, but still it's a pretty good place to go. It's a nice park. It's close by for us. And so, and working with the park rangers on working with the astronomy club and for astronomy and night sky observing, they said a common question is where in the park can we go stargazing? The park itself is down on the Sand Creek. So it's down in a valley. The park is in the part of Oklahoma. There's a lot of woods, there's the lakes, a lot of rocks. It's not Wooler Rock, but if you've been to Wooler Rock, you know the status of the Osage Hill State Park. And it says, well, where can we go stargazing and view stars where there's minimal trees? So a couple of us rode around with the ranger. Uh, we rode around the daytime and then again at night. And we settled on several different places. There's six different pretty good places. The best place is really the entrance. Um, the entrance, um, is a little bit close to Highway 60, but by 10, 1030 at night, um, there's minimal traffic. There's minimal traffic coming in and out. Do realize though that up around the entrance, that's not all state park lands. You get beyond, behind the gates, that becomes more public property. But we've been up there several times. A couple of us went out there to observe meteorites, had a good time out there. We set up a telescopes. So it's a nice area. The state park really doesn't begin until you get to about this, um, this curve. The other places is the Lake Dam. Um, you get clear from the clearing from the lake over to, to the west and northwest, a little bit to the southwest. It is up on the dam. We haven't been out there with scopes. It may or may not be a little humid depending upon the day, but it's not a bad area. The CCC camp is up on a hill. When I was talking to the ranger at the time, we went up there at night and it was a really good view of the skies, mostly to the northeast and southeast and south, looking over the ridge. Um, at that time, we took his truck up there. Uh, the roads were not really suitable for non-rangers let's put it that way there's no real road up there you can see a hiking trail that's about a half mile hike that might be a ways with some scope and equipment the ranger said if we really wanted to it'd be pretty easy to pay there's a road that goes along this road by the look at tower up to the cc camp he said we could really pave it and rock it if we really need to get to that area so we got that in mind but probably at this time until it gets to be used more probably won't but people have hiked up there at night and observed the skies with a little bit more freedom from trees uh, the lookout tower is a popular place um, i've been there at, at night a couple of times uh cohete cohete comet was out about 20 years ago went up there had a nice view of it there's a few trees around there once in a while, I talk to a ranger, can we cut down about 5,000 trees? Can we cut down one tree? And he said, well, if trees die, we can get rid of them. But um, again, there's a few trees around, but it's uh, up on the hill. Uh, it's a little elevated, maybe 10 feet up off the ground. It's a nice place to be. Uh, once in a while, though, somebody likes to camp out right in front of the lookout tower, but it's not too bad a place to go. The ball fields are kind of open. They're a grassy place. Um, you can get there by uh, vehicle. 
Uh, you should act, ask permission from a ranger before you take a vehicle down there. Usually they have a gate off and it's kind of locked, but he's willing to unlock it if you want to drive down there. It's a ball field, probably the size of four uh, baseball fields. And it's kind of grassy, but they usually keep it mowed because they do use it as a ball field during the, during the summertime and they try to keep it mowed. And that brings up to the tennis courts. That's where we go most often. Um, it's a tennis court area. Um, actually, it's easy access by road. It's not very well trafficked at night, not a lot of traffic. Um, at nighttime, we might see one car go by. Um, it's a, The tennis courts are paved and they're flat, which is nice. There's gates around and a tennis court uh, fence. Um, most of the time, if you're looking at things above 25 degrees or so, the fence really doesn't bother you, which is where we're looking most of the time. Once in a while, there's a tree or a light post that gets in our way. So we either wait about 20 minutes till the star or planet moves on or remove our scope. So nothing's perfect here. It's not the perfect place. It's not on top of the hill. It's not out in a ranch area, but as an easy access, dark place to go, it's working out pretty well. So in working with them, we made a brochure about Oklahoma Natural Skies. Uh, this is a two-page brochure. This is the front page. And we made this brochure, and they said they've made several different copies out there, and it's pretty popular to give out because people come in and ask where can they go and go looking at stars. So we have this map replicated on there. We're talking about looking around, looking up. We have a few QR codes on what's up in tonight's sky, a uh, couple of codes for getting the pocket pocket planetariums like Starwalk for Google or for Apple, and a QR code as a link to our Barstool Astronomical Society in case people are more interested in astronomy in the area and what is being done by the club. So with these locations, we have been working uh, with signage. Uh, this is in progress. Uh, the park is undergoing a management change, so we kind of put things on hold. Um, and as many of you know, we've been going to state parks, there's now a fee, a daytime use fee or an annual pass. And this has been a great boon to all the state parks. There's actually income coming in and it's been very popular. Not too many people complain. And if you're over the age of 60 or 65, it's free annual pass anyway. But um, they've been working diligently on their lights, changing lights out, updating the bathrooms, updating the cabins, making more places. So this is kind of falling on their background. Uh, we had planned to put up this informational sign about OCH Hill State Park, a little blurb about the state park, some QR codes, uh, basic, um, basic constellations that you may be seeing, and again, the map. And then each one of the sites, we're gonna have a sign with a QR code on it. And then a little compass rose indicating which way is north, south, east, and west. Because as you start walking around, you may get lost unless you know where the North Star is. But this is still in progress. And we may bring this up again, maybe starting next spring. So an update with that and talking one of the rangers out there about obtaining an international dark sky park designation. This is more of the meat of the program. And the ranger that time said, well, that is one of his goals. And the ranger replaced him, said, yes, we're still interested in doing that. And this be International Dark Sky Association and be the dark sky park designation. That's a lot of words, International Dark Sky Association, Dark Sky Park designation, what does this all mean? So if you want to know what the International Dark Sky Association is, I'm going to take the cheap way out. You can go Google it. Um, there's pages and pages of what they're doing, uh, help files, uh, presentations to use to promote dark skies. And so basically, they're kind of a global authority on light pollution an organization to help combat light pollution worldwide with a single purpose, and that's to protect the night sky from light pollution. They provide strategy, uh, help monitor results. They support actions among various chapters. 
Um, Oklahoma does not have a chapter, but Arkansas does. If you've been out to the Buffalo River, um, that area is now an official dark sky park and helps the volunteers and other stakeholders um, to help provide leadership, tools and resources. Part of this presentation is from them and just to help reduce light pollution and promote outdoor lighting for what is you know, beautiful, healthy and functional. That's why we're here. So for more information on that organization, you can view uh, darksky.org. So in talking with them, they said there are not any certified dark sky places within the state of Oklahoma. And they said, there's a lot of dark skies area. I worked with the guy from my day, looking at the pollution map, looking at the map. They said, there's a lot of resources, especially in the Southeast and Northwest areas of the state. If you look at the state, there's over 38 state parks. Um, there's over 1.4 million acres of wildlife management area and 400,000 acres of national forest and grasslands that could allow Oklahoma to become a leader with America's dark sky movement. But right now, we're gonna stick with about 1,000 acres. Um, there's over 180 certified dark sky parks in the world. When I first did this so last August, there was 150. So there's been 30 more added since August of last year. But they have five types of designations, uh, communities, parks, reserves, sanctuaries, and urban night sky places. Communities are towns. Um, Tulsa could become a community. Parks are like state parks. Reserve, of course, is bigger, like we may be one of the wildlife reserves could be. And for those um, Osage County, the uh, Osage Nation has a large reserve now, and uh, it might be interesting to work with them on making a dark sky sky reserve. Sanctuaries are even bigger. And then there's urban night sky places, which we'll talk a little bit, and that can be someplace just in town. So there's all sorts of designations that people are trying to maintain dark skies, they can help and maybe obtain a designation on this. So the dark sky park designation, all thereafter is a land possessing a quality of starry nights nocturnal environment for protected for scientific, natural, education, cultural, and public enjoyment. And that's majority of the state parks in Oklahoma. Uh, there's a few that may be lakes only. There's a few, there's actually a state park, I think within Oklahoma City. But for the most part, most of the state parks make that, um, can possess those qualities. Parks, the state parks are protected for natural con uh, conservation to make good outdoor lighting, provide dark, star, dark sky programs for visitors. I've been working with the Osage Hills and they and other parks in the state have been gradually decreasing the amount of light as they put in new cabins, they're putting in downward facing lights, they're putting in non-blue lights, they're putting in signage. Once in a while, there's still problems. One of the lakes has a, a restaurant that went on the lake and had a horrible neon sign and about a year or so later they finally commenced to put something a little bit more discreet in but again they're all trying to, to preserve the dark skies the land may be publicly owned like the state parks uh privately owned i think you could call the osage nation uh acreage privately owned but you know it's one thing they need is consent for permanent ongoing public access to this area like state parks are so to do there is there's a fairly rigorous application process and you need to support, have a community support for dark sky protection. So what does some of this entail? One question is, might be, well, what is, what's in it for me? What's in it for the state park? Why should a park do this? What are the benefits? Well, one thing it does helps bring recognition of the efforts that the park has made towards protecting dark skies. If you look out on the state park sites, they talk about uh, natural preserves, preserving the wildlife, preserving the water resources, the land resources. There's very little about protecting a dark sky. And that's one thing, if they get international dark sky designation, can help bring more recognition of what the parks are doing. A designation will help promote and highlight ongoing park efforts. 
Um, if you look over at Arkansas at the, uh, the Beaver Lake and what they're doing and their promotion of dark skies, helps wear, raise awareness of dark skies among the park leadership, staff and visitors. visitors. Um, helps promote an ecological resource with respect to nocturnal species. Uh, a lot of us know, and some may not, that having dark skies at night is important to nocturnal life. And it's important to nightlife because a lot of uh, creatures of the world make use, and that's when they feed. Uh, even when um, birds migrate, they need the dark skies sometimes. Uh, bright lights and city lights can, will, may throw off the migration path. And also reduction of sky glow for astronomic reasons and economic developed by astrotourism and culture and quality reasons. Uh, there's an international dark sky reserve, I think, out by Kitt Peak and the observatories in that area. And the cities in that area are busy on the reduction of sky glow, one for economic development and astrotourism. So it kind of boils down to increase visitation, to increase dark sky awareness, and to help protect a natural resource. So is this park eligible? In short, yes, it's a protected public land. They have opportunity for public nighttime access with without supervision. There is no minimum or maximum land area required. So the thousand acres of the state park is fine. The park does have a commitment to public education. Um, before COVID, a lot of things are now before COVID and after COVID, but before COVID, the park rangers would do a uh, several uh, presentations to hikers, to people who are camping there or lead hikes. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had the first night hike. It was on January uh, 1st, actually December 31st. It was a midnight hike. And several of us met them at the tennis courts with telescopes. We had about 75 people walk through. And it must be an exceptional dark sky resource the important information here is relative to the lands communities that surround it. So it doesn't have to be Black Mesa out in uh, Western Oklahoma. It just needs to be relative to the lands and the state park meets these features. So what are the basic steps required to get this designation? Well, there's seven of them and none of them are difficult. I'll go through more of these, but basically you need to do squad sky quality survey, create a lighting inventory, have a lighting management plan. You need to apply for the designation. You need to implement your lighting plan. You need to mo promote the dark sky and you need to maintain the activities, rinse and repeat. So let's take first at the sky quality survey. When we went out there at night, we went to eight different areas to measure with SQM meter, the dark sky. It was a clear night. You could see a lot of stars. Most of them ranged from 21.34 to 21.38. So all very similar. Um, there's three locations we kind of identified. The entrance bike trails and tennis court where we really wanted to take measurements because these seem to be most appropriate for uh, having a place for uh, people to come and observe the night skies. When it's best to do it around new moon plus or minus five days after astronomical dusk. We took three to five measurements at each site. Um, I say need volunteers. This is kind of over. We started this October of last year. The park averaged uh, 21.36. And so we completed into October of this year. And you can see the average was 21.43. That's not bad. And you can see it kind of floats through winter time. Uh, April, May, June seem to be getting darker. Um, here in August, some of you may remember, it was pretty smoky August last year. I think that affected your reading. And then we went back out in September. Uh, it was after a, a nice little shower. The skies were really exceptional clear. So it kind of ranged between 21.3 and 21.6, but the average is around 21.43. And that is darker than the rural, uh, urban areas around it. Uh, lighting inventory, uh, this is in progress. Um, the idea between lighting inventory is identify every outdoor fixture and identify light containment for indoor fixtures. 
Um, there is a residence for the park ranger. And I talked with him and he said, yeah, at night he keeps his, his shades closed and tries to keep lights from uh, hindering anything out dark. I mean, hindering the outside. Plus he's a few, uh, about a mile off the beaten path. So you go in and you make, Take like the location, what the application is, is the light operation or not? What type of fixture is it? Um, if you can tell what the aluminums or color temperature is, is it shielded or unshielded? What the operational controls are? Does it conform with the lighting management plan? And any comments, pictures are optional. Pictures prove to be kind of a hassle. So we got kind of started on this. Again, before COVID, we need to take this up again to complete this. Um, but in the meantime, the number of lights have been decreasing. They have uh, removed several lights again around the entrance. Um, they reworked the lighting around the main office. The lighting around the uh, cabins they have are slowly being reworked as they work every cabins. And so they're doing better. So, but the main idea about the lighting inventory is know what type of lights you have and we'll talk about the lighting management plan. Does it meet your plan or not? So what is this lighting management plan we're talking about? Well, it's a written policy and approved by the park management. It's pretty simple. It can be pretty simple. I read an example and it came from university out in uh, New Mexico written by nothing against PhDs. It was a hundred and some pages and pictures and pictures and maps and scientific data. Then I read one from another place. It was like 10 pages. And so really it's what do you want to put into it? But what it is, it's a guideline. It comes from a movie, doesn't it? But it's a guideline approved by the management and plans. So what's the use of your outdoor lights? What kind of shielding do we want to use? What type of lighting controls do we want? What type of lighting color and brightness do we wish to have? How do you regulate visitor lighting within reasonable limits? How do you re regulation of temporary lighting? Um, for a while out there, they were doing some road work and so they had some bright flashing lights, but their regulation was, well, in about 30 days, it's going to be gone. So it's a basic guideline for the park rangers, the park management to how are we gonna manage lighting within here? And it's really up to the park to make this approval. And so I took one, uh, again, I copied from uh, Arkansas and I kind of tailored it to the state park and presented it to them. And we'll probably hopefully be going through that this winter to see if that's what they want to do. They need more information or less information. And it's probably about 10 or 15 pages. So it's not bad, but it's really describing the lights the type of color you want, make sure there's lighting controls, are they on off by daylight or on the timer? Um, like I said, they, the lighting um, at the front, they've really reduced because they took out a lot of lights. So even without a lighting management plan, they're, they're making progress. But why is the lighting management plan important? So for this application, uh, we did the initial inquiry. They, they break it down in three phases. One is initial inquiry, two is a formal application, three is certification. So we made the initial inquiry with information we had about the dark sky measurements about the park and its guidelines and where the park is. And the IDA said, yep, you're, you're good to go on that. What we're working now is on the formal application, which we're working with creating this lighting management plan and creating our lighting inventory. When that is, gets finished and we get in our lighting management plan finished and we get our inventory finished, then we can start working with the IDA on certification. And we'll look closer with some of the IDA members on review of this and to submit for a board review and to get certification. They meet about twice a year. So we won't be doing it for 2021. We may do it for late 2022. And then implementation. Well, we mentioned this lighting management plan. So to implement at least two thirds of your outdoor lighting needs to conform with the lighting management plan at time of application. I think right now without 
digging much into it. I think the park already meets that. But in five years, you need to have 90% of your outdoor lighting. And the park manager at the time said that shouldn't be any problem. That's their goal. He liked to turn off all the lights, and that's just not possible right now. But they're kind of working on uh, reducing the, the lighting. But within five years, you need to have 90% and a written commitment for within 10 years to have 100% outdoor lighting that meets your lighting management plan. And that should be possible because one thing is lighting management plan is kind of set up by the state park. And we're kind of hoping to work this as a template so places like uh, the Black Mesa State Park can go through an application process. Some of the other state parks we have might start that to get more of this going. So once we get this kind of finished, so we want a, a good guideline that most any state park can follow. It doesn't require expensive lighting. Uh, we do have various things. They do have a budget. They're part of the board, uh, recreation and tourism. So they do have a budget they have to go by. And so there are things we kind of look at on this lighting management plan, but nothing seems to be out of ordinary or unobtainable at this time. And then you need to promote. Um, that's the big thing is to get out and promote that, yeah, you got dark skies. And when I first read this, I thought we needed all the following. I went, oh my gosh, the night sky friendly project, two external park partners like Chamber of Commerce, Power Utilities, two municipalities, which means Pahuska and Bartonsville, like, man, that's a lot. And then I struck, well, read close, you only need one of those. No, oh, okay, we could do that. And that's the night sky friendly lighting project. Uh, one thing we're looking at was the entrance and use that as an example. Uh, another park ranger came up, he'd like to do um, something about nocturnal, um, wildlife and how important dark it, uh, darkness is because he's one of the newer guys out there. And that was one of his um, studies when he was getting his degrees. So that is something we need to work on. Also to do dark sky public education uh, to offer interpretive programs. Uh, the ranger says like so after COVID, they're starting to do some now um, with the public on outreach programs about nature and also to have signage indicating the Dark Sky Park designation. And this is where I did an outreach to our club of volunteers to help make a program, just a basic program they can use as a guideline, a couple slides they can use in presentation, a couple of talking points when they go out and do their seminars or work with the hikers or work with the campers on their presentation, they can include things. And that's what we're kind of working on now uh, especially during this winter, and some of us are kind of staying in more. Again, that's where it's kind of outreaching for uh, some volunteers from our club. Or the Tulsa Club. And then you need to maintain activities. This will be more up to the park, but they need sky quality readings. Um, they can, meters are not that expensive, and the requirements doesn't say how often you need to do it, probably once a quarter be sufficient, maybe twice a year, probably doesn't need monthly leading. And John Land says, give us a minute. Do, 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 do. I hope that was John Land saying that. You guys having dark skies. This is what they call a pregnant pause. Are there any questions so far? John, you there? Yep, I'm here. 
All right, sorry, our laptop died. I got it back up and running, but you might want to go back to, I think only one slide I think we missed. All right, I won't go back to the beginning. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, that's where we're at, right there, promote. That's where we're at. Okay, promote. So you only need to do one of these. Um, there were several here. Um, easiest one, which of course is the one we're picking to begin with, is this night sky friendly project. Uh, one of the rangers has recently gotten his uh, degree in uh, noc uh, nocturnal and wildlife, and he thought it'd be good to do one on that. Or you can do the example at the front, we're going to have before and after lighting, and that could be an example set up, or the type of brochures and lighting that we're doing, as uh, I described earlier. And public education. This is where our club is starting to help a little bit. They need to offer programs um, four more times per year. On a normal basis, the ranger said, yeah, they give more than four presentations as they do uh, nature walks, their, their nighttime hikes, and to broke skies for publications. We've already have a publication that they're using and public signing at, when they get their dark sky park designation. And then they need to maintain the activities. And that's pretty simple. Let's go out and get sky quality readings a couple of times a year. List what activities you're doing, what events and outreach. List your retrofit projects. Update the lighting, uh, lighting management plan and establish dark sky events and outreach. And again, this is where our club will try to help them out again with their nighttime viewing, um, invitation when our club, club goes out to the state park that they can invite the campers who are staying out there to come and join us and just keep doing them, rinse and repeat. So what can your club do? Um, you can assist uh, with the administration. Uh, there's planning, there's paperwork, there's lighting inventory, uh, the lighting management plan. There's all sorts of example on the darksky.org website. Uh, go out and do sky quality measurements are pretty easy to do and fun. We did that over a period of the year. That's fun. And we did our measurements and stood around for another couple hours with telescopes and binoculars. Uh, help with educational clinics, CAN programs. Most clubs have some programs in the CAN for, for doing to their members. A nighttime show and sell and coordinate with astronomic, astronomic events like lunar eclipses, solar eclipses during the daytime. Uh, every once in a while, we get a nice uh, comment that comes around. And again, this is where we have volunteers to help with this. And then it's basically promote and use the natural skies. Uh, this picture was taken from the entrance. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You can see Comet Neowise kind of in the center. Uh, those two trees are kind of highlighted by lights, which are no longer in existence. And in the background, I think that's Arkansas City or Kansas City. And we're not going to talk with them yet, but um, you know, I thought it was a nice picture. The main promote and use them and tell the park rangers, send them pictures, include them in your newsletters. We had one come talk to our club as a club meeting and, and then say thank you. Basically, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So what can you do as volunteer? I asked our members to contact me or a member of our club, send us email. I can do the same for your club. So I'm doing a time check here. Do I have about another 15 minutes? Uh, John says you're good. All right. So what I'd recently added about the dark sky park is communities and urban night sky places. That's number one and number five. If we work with the entire city of Bartonsville, that would be community. What we're looking at is an urban night sky place. So in working with the state park and um, working in town, people in town, the same thing. Where can we go stargazing in town? You either don't want to go out late at night or come back later at night. They'd like to have something in town they go to. So one thing we did, oh, breaking news. Pittsburgh, the city council has passed a dark sky ordinance for all city parks, utilities, and streetlights. This was just uh, last month. 
It's one of the first ordinances of, of its kind in the country. They had somebody from uh, NASA take a Photoshop at Pittsburgh, August 1st, and they're gonna replace 35,000 street lights and install up 8,000 new ones. Don't forget there's a uh, place in town that uh, sells dark sky lights. They, they might even come and give you a presentation. They presented to our club. You can ask me later who they were. So I just lost their name. But that'd be interesting. If a city of Pittsburgh could do that, maybe Bartlesville could do it. Maybe Tulsa could do that. So we worked a little bit with the Bartlesville community development on what can we do in town. The city of Bartlesville has almost 400 acres of park, six community parks, eight neighborhood parks, and several special use parks like dog parks. So we went around at daytime. And again, we went out at nighttime to look and observe where would be the best park. So we visit all the parks late night after dark. We measured again, dark skies, this Q meter. I was curious, almost all of them had about the same reading. But what we noticed was the local light pollution from road sign glare and neighborhood light intrusions. That affected us more than what was dark overhead. Overhead almost all had the same darkness. It's just looking around you what light was hitting your eyeballs. We also want to know about parking and walking accessibility. So looking again at the light pollution of Bartlesville, you see a little green space through here. This is the Caney River. It's all flood land. So it's a little bit darker in that area. But again, it's flood land. It's low, it's around a river, and there's a lot of trees. We looked at parks up around the airport. Uh, this park up here is Sooner Park. It's a pretty big park in the upper right-hand corner. There's a lot of neighborhood glare. And then we went across this little park called Joanne Low Park. But we took readings there. And you can see over the right, it's actually been decreasing since 2012. And it reads about 20 for SQM meter. So Joanne Low Park is 31 acres. has a large arboretum around the sides. has a large clear space in the middle several picnic tables, two picnic shelters. It's handicap accessible. There's multiple walking paths. And in Bartlettsville, the Pathfinder Big Parkway is miles of walkway and pathway. So it's part of that. And it's not totally surrounded by housing developments. Uh, up to the north is a schoolyard. The school's pretty dark and there's a little a row of trees preventing light intrusion. To the left is the lake in a private house up in the right hand, left hand corner. Again, there's not much light coming from there. The light com coming from the parking area is covered by the trees. To the south is a private individual's place. In the southwest is another private individual's place. It's a little bit crowded in this area, but most of the lighting's not bad unless you get real close. So look at, looking closer at this, we talked about having a star garden. And what is the Star Garden? It's a place in town, like a garden, because we have operatoriums, we have rose gardens in town. Let's have a Star Garden within the city limits that's designated for nighttime observing, has clear views of the sky, limited trees and structures, limited intrusive lighting, and where you can go and enjoy the starry skies. So we worked with the Bartlesville City Development. They're the ones who are kind of in charge of parks. We approach them with who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, we put in a request to have them approve a city star garden at Joanne Low. We uh, desire to have mowing around designated park areas, to make it easier to set up scopes and various lighting improvements. And that was approved the same meeting, except certain areas will only be mowed beginning in the fall. They don't mow the entire park, but they say any mowed areas can use please note that parks officially close at 11 p.m. And they're kind of controlled. Um, I know people who've been out there after 11 p.m. wasn't a big issue, but they officially close at 11 p.m. And that's usually about the time we try to load up and leave. But if we're gonna have a club event that's required later hours, like to midnight or maybe one, uh, contact the city. She looked like, said, yeah, there shouldn't be a problem. We got vents all the time. So if you're gonna have a small club, it'd be different if you have three or 400 people out there, 
But for a club activity or even a town, we may get 30 or 40 people. It shouldn't be a problem to have an event. So that's why we're looking at John Lowe Star Garden. This place in the green is on top of a hill. We thought it'd be the best place. But if you could drive by there right now, they got grass. They call it the tall grass area, and the grass is about six feet high. It's kind of red, it's kind of pretty. But they mow this come late October and November. Uh, the areas around this uh, Oval Parkway are mowed up here. It's the nice clearing area. There's a park bench up there. Uh, there's various shelters and restrooms down in this area. And that's where we've been and may hold some of the parks. The clearing across here are pretty clear. This is actually a six to eight foot wide mowed area. And so we will probably have a soft opening and invite the city leaders and our club members to come out here Hopefully that may be this year. It just depends upon, um, you no know, one will talk about COVID anymore. Wrong way. The other thing they did, installed shielded lights. Uh, we asked them about getting some of these lights from Tulsa, and but they talked with PSO. PSO owns the lights. The city doesn't own the lights. They talked to PSO about what can we do for shielded lights. And we didn't even know until, so, oh yeah, we got lights up. So we went out there and this is my truck in the middle of the parking lot here, these two lights, and it's pretty nice. Um, this is the entrance to somebody else's house, but um, our observing area is further up the path. And I thought, well, the lights are actually pretty good. And so we kind of have a before and after. Um, again, we didn't know the date these lights were going in, kind of surprised, but one of our members took a picture from January. He was doing some night skies from there. So in January, there's the dark skies. And you can see the two lights. And he said, this is October. He said, same camera, same settings. And you can see the new lights are a lot less intrusive. In fact, the old lights, we could be at the other in the park and do shadow figures on our shirts. I haven't tried that with the new lights yet. And it's also interesting, this entire picture is darker than it was five years ago. So I don't, there's been lighting improvements. Um, he said it was the same camera, same settings from about the same place. Could be humidity and night sky, but definitely improvement in the lights. So uh, do we have any questions? This is a uh, night, night shot taken from one, one of our members at our first light hike on January 1st. Again, okay, once in a while you get trees in the way, a light pole depending on where you are, but he had a nice picture of the double cluster and the, uh, in the Andromeda galaxy. So do you have any questions for me? Questions. Oh. I can sort of hear you. He's got a soft voice. He's coming closer to the microphone. All right. Why well, it's coming up? This is the observatory I'm going to build out of Osage Hills. I'm just looking for a tall enough hill. <laughs> <laughs> that looks great. Uh, that's great. Thank you, John. We were on the way back from Okie Tech, stopped at Boiling Spring State Park, uh, which is really on the north side of Woodward. And I can see the Milky Way in the north. I was really mm -hmm. pleased to clear up to overhead. Their restrooms have motion sensor lights in them. So they don't come on until you actually go into the room. And they had some lights on the outside so you could see where it was. But it basically, we were in the RV area. It was a midweek, so it wasn't packed. But uh, it, was, it was pretty decent. And you know they didn't have a lot of lights around. So I, maybe other star parks are doing the same thing. And for our park ranger, most state parks are starting to improve their lights, like the restrooms they're putting up now will have motion sensors inside, uh, small lighting outside so you can see where the building is, and they won't light up the path. The light for the pathway is supposed to be on uh, motion sensors, too. So they're, I think the state's doing a good job. The uh, National Convention, I can't remember who did the program for the IDA, but... It was very good, talked about the different temperatures of LEDs, 
And I'll try to get in contact. I talked to a guy from Clayton, a ranger from Clayton, New Mexico, was working with that town on their, their, their uh, parks, dark sky stuff. So if I can locate his name, I'll get you in contact with him. Yeah, please do. The question I got for the Tulsa Club is, uh, if anybody would like to do a presentation for the Bartlesville Astronomy Club, please contact John Blazy or Bob Young. John, I had a question. Okay. Is it better back here? Yeah. That's the link okay. right there. John, this is Brad Young in Tulsa. And at my last job, I was getting a lot of gas flares out, piping the gas away. So I got involved tangentially in what was going out at Chaco, which already had their IDA certification by that point. But one of the things that they had to, to consider was of course Chaco, Chaco Canyon is a, a religious site for I believe the Navajo. And I don't know if we have any, if there's any concerns here with Osage State Park, if there's any uh, sites that are important to the indigenous people. I know the ranger said along one of the cliffs, if you walk one of the paths, there is uh, caves indicating um, like the pre um, well, what's prehistoric anyway, but from several thousand years ago, and they have found various um, um, dinosaur artifacts out there. But as far as being a prominent current indigenous people site, uh, there isn't, but becoming International Dark Sky Place, I think the main thing would be the access for the public. Um, if the access is closed, then they may not be able to do it. I don't know. That'd be a question for IDA on that. But currently, Osage Hills, I don't think, has a site with that declaration within it. OK, thank you. And also, I hope this presentation might get the Tulsa Club thinking about adopting the park. I did this presentation to Oklahoma City Club, and there's various state parks around them. I thought if every Oklahoma Astronomy Club could adopt a park or two, then that would help things along. So that might be something you might think about as one of your goals for next year, next two years, is adopt one of the local parks in the area to get an uh, IDA uh, designation. We, Maybe beat us we're in need good. of finding a new dark site in town. So I think mm -hmm. that your, your urban park thing was a good idea too. So well, thank you very much, John. And our other Bartlefield friends that are listening in. And hopefully some of them uh, without math from beyond. So thank you very much. Okay, I'll return the screen back to you. It's been my pleasure. Can you go to a PowerPoint then? Yeah. As long as you get the right there. We're going to look at the eclipse thing real quick. I'll go back up. Okay. Uh, use your mic once you get up there. One, one strange thing about the planetarium is that your voice bounces all around. So my friend Skip and his friend were visiting a while ago and it felt like they were behind them. And you probably experienced that too. Now here's some things coming up for November. I didn't get all of them up. Uh, we have new moon on uh, November 4th, full moon on the 19th. Uh, the moon's going to be near Venus over in Southwest on the 7th, Saturday on the 10th. And Jupiter on Vet Veterans Day, that's the night we have that event out of the Tulsa Botanical Garden, so that'll be good. It'll be the first quarter moon. Um, Brian has set up a telescope out on the deck if the clouds haven't uh, interfered with us. But up there at the top, if you'll see if my link works, we'll get a little preview of the, of the eclipse coming up. This is a place called Shadow and Substance. You'll have to scroll down. 
And there is an animation of the eclipse, if we can get it to run. There it goes. So for those of you new to astronomy, you can imagine you're, it's a full moon, okay? And you're on the moon and you see the, the sun begin to go behind the earth a little bit. So the sky gets a little dimmer. That outer shadow where part of the sun is blocked is called a penumbra. Oh, thank you. <coughs> and so part of the sunlight is covered. You really can't tell anything until it's about half way into it and then it looks like it's a little more gray kind of like it leaves a shave on one side then it begins to enter the earth's inner shadow where all the sunlight is blocked that's called the umbra and so uh, that portion of the moon doesn't get direct sunlight from the sun and in this particular case the very bottom edge you'll see doesn't quite get into the the inner shadow. But you notice that it's kind of reddish orange. Uh, and that's because our Earth has an atmosphere. And so you're seeing the light that's being bent from all the sunrises and sunsets around the Earth being bent onto the moon. So the center part of the moon will be darker than the other. And I, I hate the term, but you've heard the blood moon and all that stuff that's been popular the last few years has nothing to do with that. I get all sorts of weird uh, calls about people that think the world's going to end and such. But it's just, uh, you know, an actual phenomenon. But it's interesting to see. I've seen one that was so dark, a total eclipse. <clears throat> I had to get binoculars to find it, even though it was a full moon and 30 degrees up. And then I've seen one that was like an almost a new copper colored penny. And then others that were various shades of red, from the deep dark brick red to, you know, almost, a, I hate the term, but a bright blood red. So, depends on how much dust in the air. So, anyway, so that's going to be early morning, probably if you don't want to stay up for three and a half hours. You have about 2 30, and once you get into the maximum, then go back and get some zoos. All right. It's uh, Friday morning the 19th. I'm going to put it on the website this weekend. Uh, I have places out front for you to sign up for the dinner if you're planning to come. Let us know you're coming. How many are going to come with you so we can start making plans? I have a sign up sheet up here in the front. Please come volunteer to help us out if you plan to come. We need help with decorations and such. Okay, do the next one. I forgot it. Afterwards, if you're interested, uh, some of our members like to meet at Louis Bar and Grill, which is right straight down B Street here, just before you get to the turn off to the aquarium. Uh, it's a nice little place to visit. It's kind of noisy, but a lot of people like not smoke. So I don't, but others do. Yeah. yeah. yeah anyway. Switch all the way to the right. All right. We can turn the lights up. Any other questions? Brian, is the sky clear out there? It is perfect, and we are locked on to Jupiter right now. Locked on to Jupiter. Good. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, but we hope to do something like that. We're looking for a new place to, we used to have our, before probably used to have our, our Telescope set up at Bass Pro, but that's gotten a lot of too bright now. Yes, sir. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, we're, for those of you new and those of you watching the newsletter, we're working on some ideas for a new addition to our observing ground, the new observing dome. And they have got some preliminary drawings for what might be possible in the future. So skip it. I forgot, I apologize, but 
right. So I need to sign up for volunteers. You need to sign up for the dinner. If you want to order a catalog, you need to sign up out there because this is the last night. He's going to order them uh, first part next week. And hopefully get them here by the 6th. Uh, we're not going to deliver. You're going to have to come to a meeting and get them. John had to run all around town during COVID and delivering these things. And that's really not fair to him to do that. So you can come to a meeting and get it. But you got, got until next year to get it. So. All right. Appreciate y'all coming. Get waiting with the people. Is a little bit. Oh, yes. The election results. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Jerry is now elected. <laughs> The um, bylaw amendment was approved. All four officers were approved, and all of the board members were approved. Congratulations. I apologize, Jerry. Okay, so got two new members here. Get acquainted with them. Got Ben back there. He's fairly new. Recognize you. Tell me this. Oh, didn't recognize you, Gibson. Gibson and Ben are our high school kids, so let's keep kids. Yeah. <laughs> let's keep them encouraged. So, all right. And we have four guests come in late. All right, I'm done.